So we'll have a responsive reading, which means that I'll read the first verse and we'll all respond with the verse after that. We'll keep going back and forth until the end. So uh, may the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, where they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye has never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, friends, we are continuing in our sermon series, uh, Truth Is, and today's sermon is called Wind Chasing. And uh, we kind of started off this sermon series talking about how truth isn't always pleasant to hear. Uh, sometimes it can be bitter, like a, a pill, medicine that we need to swallow. It's good for you, but it's not always pleasant tasting. And I think about um, my dog uh, and the times that I've had to give uh, my dog medication. Uh, and, you know, a dog's not going to swallow a pill on its own. So what you do is you, you uh, hide the pill, the medicine, in something sweet, like peanut butter. Actually, there's companies that make uh, uh, these pill pockets for dogs, and, and they're, they're covered in peanut butter. So yeah, they, they actually make these things uh, ready, uh, full, like with peanut, peanut butter, and you just stick the pill in there, ready to go. And so the dog doesn't even know that they're getting something good for them because they're just so busy chewing on the peanut butter. And uh, my wife, who's a social worker, and her job oftentimes is to tell people uncomfortable things. She was telling me of this tactic that they learned in school where you don't want to just come out with that uncomfortable truth that's going to make people feel bad. So what you do is you do like a compliment sandwich, right? So you say things that are really nice, like you butter them up, like, oh man, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, you look so good today. You know, I like your shoes or whatever. Um, and then you're like, yeah, we're going to have to take your kids. But you know what? You look wonderful, you know? And so it's like, yeah, you know, maybe that's still hard to hear, but, you know, you do that compliment sandwich thing to try to make it smooth over a little bit. And friends, I got to tell you that today's message is going to be hard in a lot of ways. Um, there's some truth that's kind of uncomfortable. Uh, we are starting today uh, in the sermon series, Truth Is, a study in Ecclesiastes. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be going through Ecclesiastes. And this is a book that does not pull punches. And it is a book that, in, in many ways, can be hard to hear. Uh, there was someone in, someone in LGM uh, a few weeks ago who wanted to talk to me about the book of Ecclesiastes. Coincidentally, I was like, oh, that's so cool. We're actually going to be doing that in our sermon series. And so we talked about it. And after talking about it, uh, that person was like, man, this is really good. But this is really hard. And, and I think that's true. It's really hard to hear. And so... A lot of this intro is just to say, I don't know if I did a good job of covering this message in peanut butter. <laughs> some of the things are going to be a little hard to hear. And, you know, I, I got to tell you that some of the things that, that you're going to hear today are things you've probably heard before, but maybe haven't fully ingested in your soul. And so I, I just wanted to say off the top, God loves you. You guys look so good today. Man, you, you, you guys are like the best looking, you know, LGM that we've ever had. I like your shoes. <laughs> ah, you ready? We're going to get to some tough things. You know, so friends, let, let us begin with a thought experiment. Uh, so for me, oftentimes when I would dream, 
Uh, not all the time, because a lot of my dreams actually were negative. You know, I dream about like showing up to school naked and, you know, it's, it's very unpleasant stuff. But every now and then I'll have like a really nice dream. You, you guys ever have a dream where like your wildest dreams come true? It's like all the things that you were hoping for would happen, like they happen in that dream. And it feels so real at the moment. You know, like there's those times where that, there's that girl I had my eye on, I really like, she's out of my league. You know, I already get that sense that I am firmly entrenched in the friend zone, you know, that, that she, you know, has given me these cues that it's not going to happen, but I'm still hoping, still hoping it's going to happen. And in this dream, you know, this person's like, hey, Steve, can we talk? I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, girl, what's, what's going on? I, I'm usually much smoother in my dreams than I am in real life. <laughs> like, yeah, sure, girl, what's going on? And she's like, Hey, I, I just needed you to know that I have always been in love with you. And in that moment, in my dream, I'm just smiling, you know? Like, I probably, like, if you were to look at me, you know, like, like this probably happened a lot when I was in high school and <laughs> college. You know, there's a lot of these situations where I, I had, you know, this eye on a girl who didn't like me, but I was really hoping it would happen. If you were to look at me in that moment, I'd probably be smiling. Like, oh! <gasps> Like, in that moment, like, man, my heart is bursting. I'm like, yes, yes, this is so good. Or I've had this other dream. Uh, so there was this time where I was writing a novel. And um, I have to be honest, friends, novel wasn't very good. But I had this dream that it would be really good and that um, I would get signed by a major agent and I would, you know, have a New York Times bestseller and, you know, they would turn my book into a movie and, you know, I'd make, you know, millions of dollars on this, and it was going to be great. And I had this dream once, so real, so real, that this agent that I had been following, it's like this superstar literary agent, that I had sent in, you know, the proposal for my book. And that person personally called me to his office to tell me that he, he was going to publish my book. He's like, man, you're going to take off. Like, this book, it's going to just change the world. I'm like, yes, yes. And in both cases, as you know, you have to wake up, right? I wake up, and then you wake up, and then what happens? What happens? You're like, oh, man, that dream was so nice. It was so good. This is what happens when I wake up from those dreams. No, no, what? No. Have you ever had a dream that you woke up from that, like, you really wanted it to be true, and you try to go back into the dream? Like, you immediately do, like, like, just try to fall back asleep. Go, okay, go back, go back. It was so good that you want to enter back into the dream. Friends, has that ever happened to you? Am I the only one? Am I crazy here? Has that ever happened? No? Yes? Yeah, some of you guys are like, ah, yeah, okay. That's happened. So this is the thing, friends. I was so disappointed when I woke up from that because it wasn't true. <laughs> and in all those cases, I was a Christian. I had believed that God is my ultimate God. There's nothing greater than God. If you would have asked me, hey, do you think that getting this girl is going to make you happy? I'd be like, you know what? The only thing that can make me happy is God, right? Then why, when that dream doesn't come true, when it's only a dream, am I so devastated? No! <laughs> why is it that I put so much on that happening, and when it doesn't happen, it's devastating? You know, there are these truths that we hear that sound good in your head. Oh, you know what? None of these things can replace God. God is better than all these things. But friends, I just want to say, you know, for myself, and maybe for some of us here, I don't know that we fully believe that. Now, I think in your head, intellectually, you might think like, oh, yeah, yeah, money can't make me happy. You know, a girl, a relationship, love, it can't make me happy. Success, it can't make me happy. Only God can make me happy. But then why are we so crushed when you don't get those things, right? Tim Keller talks about this, and he's like, this is one of the sure signs that something is an idol in your life. When you don't get it, you feel like your life is over in some ways. Maybe not fully over, but you're really, really crushed and disappointed. Because an idol isn't just, you know, like something you bow down to and worship and, you know, sacrifice idols, to, uh, sacrifice, you know, things to. But in many ways, well, you are sacrificing. You're sacrificing your time and your energy 
And so the question that I have to ask is, well, if this isn't true, that these things are so important to you, then why do we spend so much of our time on it? Why do we chase those promotions? Why do we chase getting into these like really good schools and we're spending more time and energy than anything on these things that maybe intellectually we're saying, hey, these things can't make us happy. But maybe we think they do. And, and, and I want to let you off the hook a little bit, friends. I think we all do this. We are all living our lives for these things in some measure. But this is the thought experiment that I want us to do. Uh, because I think, you know, we, we, we think to ourselves, well, Steve, I'm never going to get it anyway. So it's just a dream, right? It's just a dream. But this is the thought experiment I want us to do. What if you actually did get your dream? Like, not in some dreamlike way where, where it's just, you know, like, like oh, yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. Or, oh, you know, like, I would totally be fine. I'd totally be, like, grounded and humble. I, you know, if I won the lottery, if I won the Powerball, you know, it, so many people, you, you ask them, what would you do? They're like, you know what? I wouldn't quit my job. I would give all the money to charity or something like that. Like, come on, really? Would you do that? Would you do that? You know, let, let, let's be honest, friends. What would happen if your dreams came true? So this is the thought experiment I want to do. So you get everything you wanted. You, you, you get that dream girl, that dream guy. They profess their love back. You get into that school that you always wanted to get into, that grad school, that medical school. You get into Harvard. Right? You get into Harvard. You, 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 you get the job you always wanted. You, you, you have that dream you know, of being a professional, uh, you know, sports person, <laughs> a professional <laughs> golfer, a professional basketball player, soccer player, whatever. You know, your wildest dreams. You know, maybe some of you, you dabble with the guitar, you sing a little bit, and in the back of your mind, you're like, what if I could make it? What if I just got discovered? Now I'm singing in church and just some record executive just happened to be visiting LGM and just kind of leans in like, oh my gosh, you have the voice of an angel. Hey, would you like to become a, a, a major recording artist? And you're like, yeah. What if all that happened? Would it make you happy? Would it satisfy you? And, and so, friends, you know, oftentimes we have these dreams and we have these things that we think are going to make us happy. And, and so I, I just want to take it to its natural conclusion. I want us to take very seriously, what if those things happen? And that's what we're going to do today. And so, friends, um, I got to say, some of the things we're going to talk about today, uh, like I said, going to be kind of hard, but let's do this together, okay? I, I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of truth that gets us somewhere. So, uh, yeah, let's take a look at what uh, it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And so, this, by the way, is attributed to Solomon. So, it says, uh, the words of the preacher, the son of David king in Jerusalem. So the, the idea or the, the, the thing about Solomon, the things that we know about him, is that he was the wisest uh, person who ever lived, uh, supposedly. Because uh, basically when he was about to become king, uh, he had this chance to pray to God for anything. And he didn't pray for power. He didn't pray for wealth. He didn't pray for um, influence or, you know, like, like a powerful army or you know, a lasting legacy. He prayed for wisdom so he could rule well. And so uh, God blessed him with all of those things, all of the, th the things that he didn't ask for. He got them with the wisdom, right? And so Solomon was this very rich, very powerful, very well-to-do guy. Um, we're told that, that he built like beautiful things. Uh, he, he, he had a, a very powerful empire. He was super rich. He had something like a thousand wives and concubines, that, that he just had every pleasure you would ever want. And these are the conclusions that, that, uh, that Solomon comes to towards the end of his life. And so it says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In the NIV, as we read, it says meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And if you look at uh, the, uh, so yeah, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the, the toil at which he toils under the sun? So in the ESV, they give you this very helpful footnote about the word that they're using for vanity or the word that gets translated as meaningless. And it is the word habel. 
The Hebrew term habel, translated vanity or vain, refers concretely to a mist, vapor, or mere breath, and metaphorically to something that is fleeting or elusive. It appears five times in this verse and in 29 other verses in Ecclesiastes. So all over the place, you see that word vanity. And I wanted to show you what it is. It is mist, right? Vapor, right? So that's what it's saying. Everything in life is like this mist, this vapor, right? And so there's a, a few things that you see from this. They say metaphorically that it's something that's fleeting, it doesn't last long, right? It's real in a sense, right? Like here it is, right? They, they, you see it? You see it? It's gone. No longer there, right? And so, you know, it's there for a little bit and then it's gone. It's impermanent, but it's also elusive. It's very hard to catch. Have you ever tried to catch a vapor, right? Didn't get anything. <laughs> Don't taste anything, right? And so that's what it's talking about when it's saying meaningless meanings. Vapor, mist, all of life is vapor or mist, everything, right? You try to get a little taste and it's gone, you know? And so it's going to continue on here and it talks about uh, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuit, the wind returns. And so this idea of, you know, uh, th th this earth is going to keep on going. You know, they, they, you ever talk about like, like, it talks about like saving the planet earth. We, we actually aren't trying to save the planet earth because the earth is still going to be here. After, you know, like, like, I don't know where you guys stand with all this like, you know, climate change stuff or whatever. You know, if we pollute ourselves like crazy, you know, if we like, you know, kill the planet, you're not going to kill the planet. You know what, who you're going to kill? You're going to kill humans, right? Like you're going to kill life. So we will be gone, but the planet will continue. Right? And so in many ways, we are like a vapor. We last. And nothing of life lasts, including us. The earth's going to keep on spinning, but we don't last. Right? You're like, yeah, Pastor Steve, duh. But it keeps on going. And it says, um, all streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with with hearing. And this idea that no matter when you see the streams going to the ocean, the oceans never overflow, right? They just never do. And in the same way that all the things that you're doing in life, you will never be full on these things. The, eyes are, are, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Uh, it talks about, uh, the, the title of this sermon, in fact, is Chasing the Wind, or Wind Chasing. And, and it's going to talk about many times in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes that it's going to talk about this idea that everything is chasing after the wind. Whenever uh, the teacher talks about something that he thought was going to satisfy him, pleasure, or, you know, um, th there was, um, you know, uh, like building great things, a big legacy, wisdom, all the things in life that we think are going to satisfy us, that he says that it's a vapor, it's meaningless, right? It's just here today, gone tomorrow. And it's like chasing after the wind is the way it gets translated often. Or in, in the, the ESV, it's striving after the wind. But there's also a very helpful footnote for what that word in Hebrew means. And so they're trying to help us out because it's kind of weird. What it literally means, what that word for striving or chasing is feeding, right? You're feeding on the winds. It's like feeding on the wind. You think it's going to satisfy you, and it doesn't. And no matter how much of this pleasure, no matter how many things of this world that you try to get to satisfy you, you're going to be hungry, right? Just like me trying to feed on the, like, man, I'm still thirsty, right? I'm, I'm going to be thirsty if I try to feed on vapor, you know, I'm always going to be hungry. It's never going to be enough. And friends, um, it goes on to say that this isn't new, right? And what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things, yet to be among those who come after. And so some of us are, it might be thinking, you're like, yeah, but Pastor Steve, Solomon didn't have internet. 
right? Solomon didn't have the iPhone. Of course there are new things, right? And this is the thing. Solomon actually was an innovator. He built bigger buildings than other people built, right? He came up with new things, you know, but he's saying, you know what? There's nothing new under the sun because he's not talking about the things themselves, right? The, the whole message is chasing after the wind. It's elusive. You can't get it. But the thing with Solomon that we're going to see, and this is why the thought experiment is so important, is that chasing after something, a dream, is so seductive and so misleading because in many ways you will never get to verify it. You're always going to be chasing it. Your life will be busy if you're trying to chase after a win because you'll never get it. So th then the question is, what if you do get it? And for Solomon, he actually did get it, right? He got all the wealth he could ever want. He got all the women he could ever want. He got all the pleasure and food and wine and influence and power and all the things that he could ever possibly want. And he says, it's not satisfying. It's like chasing after the wind. So what is the wind then? What is it that he's chasing after? Is it the things? No, because he actually got the things. It's the things, it, it's what those things represent. What we think those things are gonna do for us. And what we find is those things will never satisfy. They will never fill you up. And so that is not new. We may come up with new things, right? New inventions, new ways of living. Right now we're getting like virtual reality and stuff. And I remember when I was younger, like we would dream about virtual reality. And maybe some of you, you're like, oh, that's so cool. Like, oh my gosh, like virtual reality, that's gonna be the new thing. Man, if I could get a virtual reality headset, that's gonna be the best entertainment. Some of this other entertainment that I saw, not that fulfilling, but oh, the virtual reality, that's gonna be great. Like, oh, well, you see virtual reality, like, you know, it's only like you only get to see, you don't get to touch. They're gonna come out with gloves where you can like touch things. Right? I, I'm telling you, man, this is coming in the next 20 years. You're going to be able to smell things. Right? You're going to be like, oh my gosh, I can experience anything. Friends, I got to tell you, no matter what they come up with, Solomon is always going to be right. This is always going to be the truth. No matter what we come up with underneath the sun, it will never be enough. It will never satisfy you. You will never be full on that. It's always going to be a chasing after the wind existentially, we will not find meaning in those things. And there's a reason why. Um, and, and so it, it goes back to the idea that these things are fleeting and impermanent, and they are elusive. They will never fulfill you. So friends, uh, let's go to modern examples, right? So, you know, it, it, nothing is new under the sun. This has been done before, and it will be done again. And this story, friends, is one we keep playing out in our culture again and again and again. So uh, you might have heard of this guy, Magnus Persson. Have any of you guys heard of Magnus Persson? Uh, so maybe you haven't heard of him, but you've heard of his, uh, his main product, which was a game called Minecraft. Minecraft is a huge game. Um, Magnus Persson was one of the founders of, uh, uh, of a software company called Mojang. And they were bought by Microsoft about three years ago. And so uh, Microsoft paid $2.5 billion to buy Mojang and the rights to, to Minecraft, right? And so Magnus Persson uh, was striving and always just trying to make the best possible game. And then he did it. He achieved all of his wildest dreams, right? He became a billionaire overnight. And, you know, I heard that Magnus Persson bought the most expensive house that was ever sold in Beverly Hills. He outbid Beyonce and Jay-Z to buy a $70 million mansion that had like a bowling alley in it. I mean, it had like everything you could ever want, right? The best house ever. And this guy doesn't have to work a day in his life. He's a billionaire with a B, right? And so a few months later, this is what Magnus Persson wrote on his Twitter. He said, hanging out in Ibiza. Does anyone know where Ibiza is? Anyone? Spain. And Ibiza is known as this island paradise. It's like where all the A-list celebrities go. It's beautiful, like beautiful, just oceanside, scenic, beautiful, beautiful place. So he goes to the, the most beautiful place where it's so expensive, only A-list celebrities can go there. He's hanging out with all these people that he used to watch in the movies, 
right? He's like hanging out in Ibiza with a bunch of friends and partying with famous people and able to do whatever I want. And I've never felt more isolated. And then he said this, the problem with getting everything is you run out of reasons to keep trying and human interaction becomes impossible due to imbalance. The problem with getting everything is you run out of reasons to keep trying. This is one of the things about chasing after things, the grind, the climb. It's an illusion. It keeps you busy, but oftentimes we mistake busyness with meaning. We're like, well, I'm busy, I'm doing something, I'm productive, right? And he spent all his time chasing after these things, but maybe he never imagined to himself that he would get it. And once he got it, he's like, yeah, not that great. It's not that great. It didn't satisfy me. It wasn't enough. What is that about, friends? You know, some of you are thinking like, ah, Pastor Steve, you can cherry pick any quote you want. Yeah, maybe there's some depressed billionaire out there, but come on, there's got to be all these like really satisfied, happy billionaires out there, right? Um, there was research that um, they did a few years ago on lottery winners. And uh, these lottery winners, um, like, like uh, uh, researchers followed them around. This is a study from 1978. And what they found was, uh, you know, after they won, their happiness goes through the roof, right? They win and like, oh my gosh, I won the lottery! And then they go out and they spend lots of money, right? And so they're immediately very happy. There's a spike. You know, how happy are you? And they're like, whoa! So happy, right? But they followed these lottery winners, and just a few months later, and a year later, and after a few months, their happiness drops to just about where everyone else is. And then after a year, they're exactly where everyone else is. In other words, if you were to look at the life, the inner workings of a, a, a lottery winner, a year after they won the lottery, how happy are they? How content are they? How much meaning do they have? It will look exactly the same as anyone else. Anyone else. Exactly the same. Friends, do you believe that? Do you believe that? So this is what researchers said. I, I want to show you uh, what, what they actually said. Lottery winners are not happier. And so th this is what, what, what their findings were. They said, eventually the thrill of winning the lottery will itself wear off. If all things are judged by the extent to which they depart from a baseline of past experience, gradually, even the most positive events will cease to have impact as they themselves are absorbed into the new baseline against which further events are judged. Thus, as lottery winners become accustomed to the additional pleasures made possible by their new wealth, these pleasures should be experienced as less intense and should no longer contribute very much to their general level of happiness. So what does all that mean? It means that when you experience something that's new and novel, you get a new phone, right? You get a new haircut. You try food for the first time. You put on headphones that cost $50,000 and they're supposed to be the best headphones in the world. You get them and you're like, oh, sounds so good. Mmm, tastes so good. Oh, I'm so happy at first. But after a while, we are designed, this is the way we are designed, friends, is that experience stops becoming novel. And of, of experiencing being a millionaire, billionaire, whatever it is, listening to beautiful music, it starts to become routine and baseline. Your baseline changes, and it no longer provides a thrill for you anymore. This is how all pleasure works, by the way, friends. You know, And so they call this the hedonic treadmill, the, this idea that you get pleasure, and you keep trying to get that pleasure, and you get pleasure, and you're like, man, I'm so happy and fulfilled, and this is so wonderful. But after time, you go back to where you were before, right? And we know this is true because no one has ever experienced a pleasure. This is what Solomon is saying. By there's nothing new under the sun. He's experienced everything. And there's no pleasure. There's no experience that you get to. And you're like, ah, oh, this is the quintessential experience. I've had this and I don't need to experience anything anymore. Even billionaires, they get bored. They get listless. They get these things that make them happy. And then do they stay happy forever? No, it's not the way it works. In a lot of ways, we are fooled by something that is very easy to make this mistake. Because friends, I, I'm not saying that these things don't make you happy. Yeah, of course they make you happy. But they don't make you happy permanently. They wear off. Every experience is that way, right? 
And so what we think is that we think that pleasure and money and all these things that, that we so seek after, that it, it's a linear thing. You get more stuff, you become more happy. And this is why billionaires are not more happy than you. Because if you get money, right? Like when you're a kid, you get $100, it's the greatest thing. You're like, oh my gosh, I have $100, right? It's the greatest thing. Or if you give money to somebody who's poor, if you give them a little bit of food to somebody who's starving, of course, it affects their happiness so much. Their happiness goes off the charts, right? They're like, are you happier than when you were starving and you didn't have any food? Of course they are happier, right? Or if you're in the woods and you're, you're cold, right, and you're freezing to death, you have nothing in your stomach, and you find a little simple cabin, and you go in there and it's warm, and there's food, you don't even care what the food is, but there's food, and you get to eat, you get to be warm, you are gonna be off the charts happy, right? And so we think that will continue. But the thing that we find, and this is what all the science bears out, this is something that marketers will not tell you, commercials will not tell you this, but it's the truth. The more happiness and pleasure, or the more pleasure you get, it does not make you uh, proportionally more happy, right? Like if I got a little bit of money and made me this happy, then if you double it, you don't become doubly happy. If you triple it, you don't become triply happy. If you multiply it by a thousand, you don't become a thousand times happier. It's not the way it works. Happiness levels off, right? And friends, this is the thing. If all of this were true, then why are we collectively as a species not more happy? So I wanna show you another graph. This is a graph of our wealth over time, right? So this is wealth, uh, not just you know, relative to your surroundings, but just period. Like, like the wealth that we've experienced in the world has gone off the charts in the last you know, 500 years, right? So if you look at our wealth back then, and then you look at like, how much we are able to have now, and, and again, this is adjusted for inflation and all these things, we are way wealthier than we ever have been before, right? And America is one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. Right? We have more stuff than everyone else, basically. Depends on what measure you use. Uh, to some people, we're top 10. To other people, we're number one. But everyone agrees we are one of the wealthiest nations on earth. Did you know, friends, that the rates of depression in the U.S. are the third highest in the, in the world? The third highest in the world. The only countries that are higher are India and China. Right? So if wealth and all this stuff were supposed to make you happy, then why is it working, right? Um, Brene Brown has this quote, and I think it's something to, to think about. We are the most in debt, obese, addicted, and medicated adult cohort in history. So this generation is the most in debt, obese, addicted, and medicated in history. So something's not working, friends. We are not getting happier, right? And so, again, this idea of the baseline, this is what happens, right? Did you know that everyone in America, when you compare us to the rest of the world, we are all wealthy, right? But the thing is, you don't feel wealthy. Why? Because you're not comparing yourself to the rest of the world. You're comparing yourself to the person who lives next to you, to the person in your class, right? And so your relative wealth is what you measure. You know, so you may be wealthier than somebody who lives on the other side of town, but you're not comparing yourself compared to them. You're comparing yourself to that person who has more than you. You know, you get into a school, and, and if you can get into any college, I mean, that is a, a tremendous thing. You are way ahead of most of the world in terms of education. You're one of the smartest people on the planet Earth if you get into Michigan State or if you get into WCC or whatever. But we're like, oh, but I didn't get into Michigan. Sorry, Michigan State people. Or you get into Michigan, oh, but I didn't get into Columbia. But you get into Columbia, oh, but I didn't get into Harvard, right? And it, we're always comparing ourselves. And so the thing with wealth, what they find and this is bearing itself out with everything else we've said before, is that no matter how much money you have, you ask people, do you have enough money? And almost everybody says no. And then you ask them, how much more money do you need to be happy and content? And what almost everyone says is just 20% more than what they have. They don't say 20% more than what they have, but if they have you know, $100,000, they'll say, I need $120,000. If you have $60,000, they'll say $75,000. Right? People just give a number 20% more, about 20% more than what they have. So what's going on? Yes, a millionaire, how much do you need? Oh, I need a million point two, right? It's always just a little bit more because you are comparing yourself to other people around you and 
those experiences as you are looking at this world that we live in, it wears off. The novelty wears off. You get that car, you're so happy to get a car. Then you look down the street and somebody's got this nice new Lexus. You're like, well, I don't have a Lexus. I have a car, but I don't have that car. You know, that car's newer than mine. And all these things wear off. I want to tell you about Dave Mustaine. Do you guys know who Dave Mustaine is? Um, So Dave Mustaine is a very, very wealthy and very, very famous person. Here's a picture of him on the end. That's Dave Mustaine on the far right. And so uh, my story is titled, Dave Mustaine, a failure, question mark. So Dave Mustaine was the lead guitarist for a, 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 a thrash metal group in the early 80s. So the year was 1983, and this band was about to be signed to a major label. Dave Mustaine was a guy who, you know, ended up being in a thrash metal group, right? Like, like, like it was like borderline satanic, you know? And it's kind of funny because he grew up in a very restricted religious environment. His parents were, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, he was allowed to listen to music, like, like any modern music. And so he rebelled from his parents in the most wild way possible. And he joined a metal, a thrash metal band, right? And Dave Mustaine, you know, just decided to himself, you know, I've been deprived of all this pleasure. I'm just going to go for it. And so he lived this uninhibited la- lifestyle. He had all this bent up anger from his childhood that was never dealt with. And so he not only experienced life, but he just, like, like he was angry as he did it. And so he was frequently drunk and high, as many people in these metal bands were at the time. That wasn't new, but he was an angry drunk. Uh, and so it got to be a really big problem because he would pick a fight with anyone that, you know, just got in his way. And it became such a big problem with his band that one morning, uh, they, were, uh, they were days away from being signed to a major record label. They were just about to uh, record their first album. They had gone to New York to record this album. And so they woke him up early in the morning, and they said, hey, you got to go. And he's like, what are you guys talking about? He's like, you're out. You're out of the band. They packed his bags for him, and he's like, what, no warning? They're like, no, man, you got to go. No second chance? No, you got to go. And so... He's like, okay, well, you're going to take me to the airport? They're like, no, you're not going to the airport. They put him on a bus, and they sent him back to Los Angeles, right? And so he had to drive across the country on this bus or ride on on this bus uh, for four days. And the whole time he's stewing, he's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe they did this to me. He's so angry at, at, at his bandmates. He's like, you know what? I'm going to live to show these guys that they made the biggest mistake, right? So... Over that four days, he started plotting his revenge, that he was going to come out with his own band, that he was going to make more money than them, become more successful. He's going to write better songs. He wrote all these songs on that bus ride home. And one of the songs he wrote, he came up with this, this phrase that sounded really metal. It was called Megadeth. He's like, oh, that's a great name for a band. So he named his band Megadeth. And Megadeth went on to become one of the most successful uh, metal bands in history. Uh, when, when I was growing up, a lot of people listen to Megadeth and, and heavy metal, and they're considered one of the big four, one of the greatest metal bands ever. Uh, they, they went on to win uh, like one Grammy, they were nominated for 12 Grammys, and uh, they made like $50 million over the course of these years. And Dave Mustaine is considered one of the greatest guitarists to ever live. The problem was, the band he got kicked out of was called Metallica. Metallica is not one of the most successful metal bands. They are the most successful metal band of all time, right? And not only that, but they're the third highest grossing uh, group in, like, band in the entire uh, history of of music in America, right? Like, they've just been wildly successful. So no matter how successful Dave Mustaine came, his standard was always, I must be more successful than Metallica. He was chasing the wind. He was chasing this vapor. He was always super unhappy. So for us, we're like, man, this makes no sense. This guy is more successful than any one of us probably ever will be. He makes more money. He's more popular. And he was really, really unhappy. And they interviewed him years later, and he's crying. He's weeping over the fact that he got kicked out of Metallica. And he was never able to be more successful than Metallica. Interestingly enough... Dave Mustaine, you know, he continued to use the drugs and to be unhappy even as he was experiencing all the success. 
Megadeth went through so many different uh, uh, bandmates. You know why? Because he always had to be better than Metallica. Ah, you're not quite as good. New drummer, new bassist, new backup singer, whatever. You're like, we need the best. We need the best. He was obsessed. He never got there. So one day, he's, his life is broken. I mean, he has reached the pinnacle of music, but he's not better than Metallica. And he's thinking to himself, what am I doing with my life? He's like, I've tried everything. I've tried drugs, I've tried music. This is a true story. One night, Dave Mustaine decides that he's going to pray. And he's like, I've tried everything else. Why not try Jesus? What do I have to lose? And so he prayed. And Jesus came into his life. And what Dave Mustaine says now, looking back on his career, is he's, he says, what Jesus has given me is the one thing that all of the other things could not give me. It's true peace. And one of the things that actually happened after this is that he reconciled with Metallica. Um, he's gone on stage with them. He's performed with them. And he said that I've never been more happy than I am now. I've never been at more peace. Friends, this is a very common message that you hear. And friends, maybe for some of us, and you know, I, I've been saying that even as a Christian, you know, that just following God didn't automatically make my life better. But the thing is that God, you know, God is great in everything. But the problem is that we set these goals and we hang our hat on an event, on a thing, on, a, on something, a goal that is going to make you happy. And all of those things will necessarily disappoint you. And the problem is in goal setting period. Remember uh, the story about the guy who uh, made Minecraft, right? He's like, part of the problem is once I got to the goal, there was no more th thing to live for. I got there and then all the coolness and all the novelty of that, that thing that I was chasing, it wore off. Now what? Now where do I live my life? Now what am I striving for? And that is exactly what it's talking about in, in uh, Ecclesiastes, this idea of chasing after the wind, something that you were always chasing. So it says here, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Why is it an unhappy business? You're never satisfied. It's never enough. You're always going to be unhappy because you're always seeking for something that never gets realized. It's just a chase, one chase after another, after another, after another. And he said, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, vapor, mist. It's a chasing after the wind. You're going to keep trying to chase it. You're going to keep going after it. It's never going to be enough. And every time you get it, you're going to say, yay, and you're going to feel happy for a little bit. And then a few days later, a few months later, you're going to say, now what? What do I live my life for? And this is Christians included. If for you, Christianity is just one more experience in this life that we get to, and we say, okay, that's going to be it. I accepted Jesus in my life. Yay. Well, yeah, that's great. And God is eternal, but we are not. Our ability to be able to receive the grace of God, that is not something that is going to last forever on this plane of eternity. Why? Because we are not eternal. Your stomachs are not eternal. There's nothing new about us. We're the same human beings as we're going around in Solomon's time. Even religious experience, it will wear off. Do you guys remember um, when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness? And they had this wonderful gift called manna. You guys remember that? So manna was like, it was like bread from heaven, right? Just in the morning, there would be these sweet flakes that would be on the ground, just a miracle. They're wandering in the desert. There's no food around. But every morning, they have manna. They're like, oh, this is great, right? And they would eat it, but God would tell them, you only have enough manna for this day. Only enough manna for this day. And so some people, they would try to cheat, and they'd be like, well, you know what? I'm going to store a little extra manna. What if God doesn't provide tomorrow? I got to make sure I have enough. Or, oh, what if I just get a little more hungry tonight? I just need a, a, a snack. And so they would store up more manna. And what they would find is in, in the morning, it would rot. It would all rot. The manna would go away. It would be no good after the day. Every day, they would need to come back and get the manna again and again 
and again. Now, friends, God is eternal, right? God's grace, the blessings of God, these things are eternal things. But the way you experience them is daily. Your experience of God is something that cannot last just from one experience. In other words, friends, just because you accepted Jesus Christ at the age of 12, and that's all you did, that is not going to last until the day you die. Because by the way, you've got to live for something. What are you going to do then? What are you going to do for the rest of your life? You've got to do something. And so there's a clue in Scripture. There's clues all, all around in Scripture. But one of the things that Solomon realizes is, you know, the thing that is eternal, right? Because part of the problem with mist and vapor is it goes away. It's not permanent. The one thing that is eternal is God. So the answer lies in God, but it must lie in what he is giving you the kind of life that he wants you to live. Those are the things that are going to be most worthwhile. So I want to show you, friends, uh, Isaiah 9. This is one of the most famous passages that talks about, um, it gets quoted in the New Testament when it refers to Jesus. This is the prophecy of the Messiah, the king who is going to come rule forever. And so uh, some of the stuff you, you might recognize if you've read the Gospels. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. You have multiplied the, the nation. You have increased its joy. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So we have a king that will reign forever. That is the promise of the Messiah. And then it goes on to say this. Uh, uh, This is also in the Gospels, uh, but it's from Isaiah 9, 7. It says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. NIV, which some of you guys know, I, don't, I think the NIV, they translate to, or they, they interpret when they should just be translating. Uh, the ESV translates that word increase as what it is, increase. But the NIV is like, man, what does that mean? So what they, they say is the greatness of God. But the problem with that translation is it gets rid of the process. What is the increase of government? What do we talk about when your money is increasing? <laughs> not just great, it's increasing. It's getting more, right? Your joy, it's increasing. It's not staying stagnant. It keeps going up and up and up and up. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So friends, it's kind of cool. How have we been designed as human beings? Nothing is ever enough for you. It will never be enough. There's always going to need to be a novel experience. This is part of human brokenness. It's part of the human condition. It's the way you're designed. It's what's forced us to adapt as a species and to keep on moving forward and innovating, right? It's been useful for civilization, but very bad for mental health. Very bad for the soul, because you are never satisfied. And it's kind of a cool thing to think that the government that Jesus is establishing that will continue into eternity is not a stagnant government. It's not a stagnant rule. What do we hear about the kingdom of God? It will keep on increasing forever. In other words, friends, the reign of God is the one thing that you will never get sick of. It keeps getting better and better and better. Think about what the reign of God is. It's about seeing more of God's rule and reign. In this world, you may see the kingdom of God when enemies like Dave Mustaine and the members of Metallica, when they reconcile, what is that? The kingdom of God, reconciling of enemies when you see people start to let God rule in their life, start to become the one that they come to as the source of all joy. You're not seeking for these things that will never satisfy. What is that? That's the reign of God. That's the kingdom of God. When you start to see people work for the wholeness, the healing of this world, you see brokenness. You see starvation. You see people who don't have enough, people who are poor, When you go to St. Andrews and you feed people, what is that? It's the kingdom of God in action. And this kingdom will know no end. And it will keep getting better and better and better and better. 
and in your life as well. Is God fully reigning? Is God fully reigning in my life? I'm Pastor Steve. I'm a big deal. I've been living this Christian life for a long time. That's not how I talk, but let's just pretend for a moment. You know, I think I'm the hot stuff. I think I'm this great Christian. Have I arrived? You better believe that I have not arrived, friends. I'm still learning about the reign of God in my life. There are still areas of my life where I need more Jesus. I need more of Jesus' reign. I need more of Jesus' peace. And I gotta tell you, as I'm learning more, it gets better and better and better and better and better. Yeah, it's one of these things that it will know no end. And that's one of the beautiful things about the kingdom of God. And, and it goes on to say, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth, and forevermore. Have you ever thought about that word? Forevermore. It's a weird, weird word. Because forever just means keeps going. But what is more? Better and better and better. Forevermore. That's the kingdom of God, friends. It is the one thing in this world. Everything else in this word, world gets old. I think I've talked about this before, but I got very disillusioned about cell phones. You know, I, I, you know like a cell phone, it's a tool, whatever, it's great. But you get, self, you, know, you get this iPhone, you're like, iPhone 7, there will never be a better phone. I heard that they plan like five models ahead of time. They're planning the obsolescence of your phone, right? They're like, oh, this is the best iPhone we've ever had until next year's model, until the iPhone 8, until the iPhone 9, until the iPhone 10, until the iPhone 11. It will never end. That thing will never satisfy you. It will never be enough. It will degrade. It gets old. There is nothing new under the sun except the thing that isn't under the sun, the kingdom of God that came from heaven to earth and is now in breaking. Remember, this is Old Testament, right? Nothing new under the sun until what happened? Jesus came down under the sun, under the sun. <laughs> now the sun is here with us. And now we have a chance to let God's reign in forevermore, forever and more. So friends, um, I just want to close with this thought of what are the things we are seeking? You know, what is your life going to be worth living for? So I started this, this uh, sermon with a thought experiment. What if you got all the things you wanted? And I, I tried to, you know, call us out a little bit to say, Hey, let's not kid ourselves. You may think it's not the most important thing in your life, but you are spending more time on these things that will not satisfy than you are on the things that will. Let's just be honest. We're spending more time on our careers and school. And all these, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but let's just be honest, right? This thing will not satisfy you, yet you are spending almost all your time on it. And then I hear people who say, like, like when we talk about spiritual disciplines and spending time with God, and then people say this, Pastor Steve, I have no time. I'm like, it's not that you have no time. It's that you're not making time. It's that you've spent all your time on something impermanent, and you have dedicated no time for something that is. And so one of the things that I had to get to in my life, and one of the things that we learn about dreams and goals is until they can be touched, you still can believe the lie. Maybe if I get it, it's gonna satisfy. Everyone tells us, Solomon, all the people have come before us, they say, hey, I got to the mountaintop, it's not all that. I touched it, and it immediately was vapor, disappeared. And then there was a new thing to touch, a new thing to get to. It was never enough. Friends, when are we gonna start believing that fully and start living into the eternal things? And so for me, I got to a place in my life where I'm like, yeah, you know, I keep thinking, you know, my church gets a little bit bigger. If I can have more influence, maybe I can write books. Maybe I can be like John Piper or Tim Keller or one of these people. Then that's going to be enough. But one of the things I needed to realize is it's never going to be enough until I let God reign fully in my life. But I don't have time for that. I have to build my church. I got to plan a sermon. I got to do all this stuff. And I do it with so much stress, so much anxiety. I'm chasing after the wind. And the thing that I needed to do, the thing that was most important, the thing that has changed my life more than anything is when I just stopped chasing the wind. I stopped chasing all the things under the sun. 
And I just stood still, and I let the sun come to me. It's one of the things I've done in my life. I've talked about this many times before. It's, it bears repeating. I spend every day 30 minutes. I try to make it the first thing I do in the day. My priority is to let God come to me. Be still and know that he is Lord. And let that rain come into my life. God, what are the things I've been chasing? Where do I think my permanence and my joy and, and my, my, all, all my treasure is going to come from? If I can't have it in you, then all of these things are just going to jerk me around for the rest of my life. I'm going to be chasing after them, and existentially, I'm always going to be moving. It's always going to be a moving target. I'm never going to be satisfied. But what if you could let the kingdom of God come and reign in your life? It reconfigures your priorities. It changes the way you live. So the things you are chasing are not the things that validate you, are not the things that give you your ultimate joy and enjoyment, but they're their cherry on top. They're, they're a, 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 a tool that you can use in your life. You can live for the things that really matter. You can focus on relationships and loving people and building the kingdom of God, healing this broken world. You can make that your priority and trust that, yeah, you know, money will come and go and I can live for that in a, a, in a sense, but that is not the ultimate thing for me anymore. That is not my God. I don't need to be up, you know, countless nights just worrying about money. I know that God is in control. I know that he reigns and I'm living for something more permanent. God will provide. God will reign. And first things need to be first. This is the truth, friends. We are living for things that will not last. Can we start living for the things that will? 